chapter eleven of molly's prince this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org molly's prince by rosa newshet carey chapter eleven a noticeable man with large gray eyes as high as we have mounted in delight in our dejection do we sink as low wordsworth after all molly had her way and waveney in spite of piteous pleading and remonstrance became the reluctant possessor of a warm dress and jacket mr ward had put his foot down in a most unexpected manner if waveney would not buy her jacket he would go without his great coat barker and chandler had been paid and there was sufficient money for everything and when waveney understood that any shabbiness on her part would be grievous in his eyes she yielded at once if father wishes it i will get the things she said to molly but i never enjoy anything unless you share it but molly would not listen to this what does it matter about me she said gaily i am only a poor little cinderella whose pumpkin coach has not arrived my old jacket will do quite well until christmas and then when the purchases were made molly was like a sunbeam for the rest of the day waveney went twice to the hospital before she started for erpingham but each time she found mcgill more rambling and confused and though he roused at the sound of her voice he always thought she was sheila corporal marks looked more dejected than ever but he maintained that the sergeant was doing finely waveney thought it was only the little man's natural pugnacity and habit of arguing and that he did not really believe his own assertion but though he pretended to grumble he nursed his friend devotedly that their corporal never leaves him one of the pensioners remarked to waveney you would think they were brothers to see them and fight they would too about those plaguy sepoys that you might have taken them for a pair of kilkenny cats but bless you miss it was just for the fun of it the days slipped away all too fast and one morning molly awoke with the thought that only one whole day remained before waveney left home they were very busy all the morning packing her box and in the afternoon waveney who felt restless and rather low-spirited at the sight of molly's woe-begone face proposed they should visit their favourite haunts the lime avenue old ranelagh and the embankment it is so warm and the house feels so stuffy she added for waveney loved air and exercise and would gladly have been out of doors the greater part of the day molly willingly assented to this but she was languid and out of spirits and soon grew tired so they sat down under an acacia in old ranelagh and watched the children playing round them it was one of those golden days of september when the very air seems impregnated with strange sweet fragrance when one thinks of waving cornfields and how the wheat ripples in the breeze like a yellow sea and of deep quiet lanes with nut copses and blackberry thickets or better still of a hillside clothed with purple heather as though nature had flung one of her royal robes aside a day when the grand old earth seemed mellow and ripe for the sickle of old time and a soft sadness and a sense of quiet brooding are over everything the summer is over it seemed to say and the fleeting shows of youth and the fruits of the earth are garnered in nature's storehouse and the feast of all good things is ready so eat and enjoy and be thankful the sisters were sitting hand in hand and waveney's small face looked pinched and long from inward fretting for she was one who took the troubles of life with outward calmness and chafed under them inwardly but the sunshine and the crisp sweet air and the soft patter of red and yellow leaves brought their message of comfort molly she said trying to speak cheerfully 
i am thinking what a beautiful world it is and how good life is after all in spite of worries here we are making ourselves miserable because i have to go away to-morrow do you know we are like those two foolish children we saw that day when father took us in the country don't you remember how they cried because their nurse wanted them to go down a lane it was so dark and narrow they said and they were sure the wolves would eat them up but the nurse knew there was that lovely open meadow beyond do you read my little parable dear yes i think so returned molly but she spoke doubtfully waveney was rather prone to moralise when she found herself alone with molly she called it thinking aloud molly was her other self she could tell her things that she would not have breathed to any other creature well you see went on waveney one has steep little bits of road now and then like that poor king of corinth sisyphus was not that his name we have to roll our stone up the hill difficulty but one never knows what may happen next by the by molly i rather fancy that m blackie only pretends to play at things and that he is really a clever man there is something i cannot make out about him he is mysterious and then why did he buy king canute because his friend wanted a historical picture returned molly who always believed what people said i know he told us so replied waveney thoughtfully molly i have a sort of conviction that you will often see him that he means to turn up pretty frequently at cleveland terrace whatever makes you think so asked molly much astonished at this what a ridiculous idea wave when you told him yourself that you were leaving home to-morrow but he does not come to see me retorted waveney and then she added hastily he is a friendly sort of person and comes to see us all oh yes of course returned molly perfectly satisfied with this view of the case then i dare say he will come sometimes when father is at home he asked me very particularly when he was likely to be in and if i went out in the afternoon and i said oh dear no i always go out early to do the marketing and then i am too tired to go out again waveney he did look so kindly at me when i said that walking tires you then what a pity and he seemed quite sorry for me he is a nice little black prince replied waveney rather absently the children had left the gardens with their nurses and the place was now quite deserted the next moment a gentleman crossed the lime avenue and walked slowly down the path as he passed their bench he looked at the two girls in a quiet observant way and passed on as soon as he was out of hearing waveney said a little wickedly molly we have found him at last the noticeable man with large grey eyes for this was an old joke of theirs they had been reading wordsworth together one summer's day on this very bench and when waveney had come to the stanza she had laid down the book i like that description molly she had said it gives one a pleasant idea of a person a noticeable man with large grey eyes now i wonder if we shall ever see any one answering to that description molly laughed and looked interested when waveney said this but a moment later she whispered hush he's coming back and then to molly's alarm for she was very shy and timid he stopped and lifted his hat will you have the kindness to inform me he said addressing molly in a peculiarly clear mellow voice if this path will take me to dunedin terrace i'm not well acquainted with chelsea molly blushed and looked confused topography was not her strong point i think so i'm not quite sure do you know waveney yes but it is rather a roundabout way dunedin terrace is quite half a mile away and then waveney rose from the bench and considered her bearings while the stranger quietly awaited her decision he was a tall man and though his face was plain there was something in his expression that attracted notice an air of unmistakable refinement and culture the keen grey eyes had already noted molly's lovely face now they were fixed on the plainer sister i think i can direct you properly now observed waveney with her usual brightness but it is just a little complicated you must go out of this gate and cross cleveland terrace take the second turning to the right and the first to the left and you will be in upper dunedin terrace 
thank you very much and then he repeated her directions gravely and slowly and then lifting his hat with another thank you walked quickly away yes i was right continued waveney he is certainly a noticeable man and what large clear eyes but mollie shrugged her shoulders a little pettishly i think he was rather ugly she remarked and he is quite old five and thirty at least and did you notice his shabby coat why it was almost as shabby as father's no returned waveney i did not notice that i was only thinking what a grand-looking man he was and he spoke so nicely too then as molly was evidently not interested she changed the subject and they sat talking until it was time for them to go home to tea it was a melancholy evening in spite of all waveney's efforts mr ward was tired and dull and noel was out of humour but his sisters who understood him thoroughly knew that this was only his mode of expressing his feelings so he drew up his coat-collar and answered snappishly whenever waveney addressed him and grew red and pretended to be deaf when she alluded to her going away and when she was bidding him good-night and her fingers touched his rough hair caressingly he threw back his head with an annoyed jerk i hate having my hair pulled he said crossly so give over old storm and stress and then he whistled and walked out of the room with his chin in the air but not before waveney saw that his glasses were misty molly darling remember i shall be home on sunday and it is tuesday now were waveney's last words as she jumped into the train and her father closed the door waveney stood at the window until the dark tunnel hid them from her sight molly's sweet face was swollen with crying and her father's countenance was sad and full of care the child whom he had cherished with peculiar tenderness was leaving his roof because he was incapable of providing for his household properly he had been a failure all his life and he knew it but it was bitter to him that his old friend althea should know it too waveney took a cab when she reached durham the driver touched his hat when she told him to drive to the red house erpingham i know it he said as he took off his horse's nose-bag there ain't a cab driver in durham that don't know the ladies at the red house they give us a supper in christmas week and there is another for the costers that use their donkeys well and it is a rare spread too and then he smacked his lips and jumped on the box waveney looked out and tried to interest herself in the various objects they passed but her head felt heavy as lead the common looked lovely in the afternoon sunshine and as before the children were dancing in and out the trees some little boys were sailing a boat on the pond and a newfoundland was swimming across it with a stick in his mouth some riders were cantering over the grass every one seemed gay and animated and full of life dogs barked children laughed and the cawing of rooks filled the air as they drove in at the lodge gates the two little yorkshire terriers ran out barking and the elderly maid mitchell came to the door my mistresses are out ma'am she said pleasantly but nurse marks has orders to make you comfortable will you please to go in and i will see to the box and pay the cabman no ma'am as waveney timidly offered her some money miss harford always pays the cabman herself ay and pays them well too observed the driver with a complacent grin no arguing with a poor chap who has to work hard for his living about an extra sixpence waveney felt very strange and forlorn as she stepped into the hall with fuss and fury barking excitedly round her and then she saw a little old woman with a very long nose and hair as white as snow bundling down the wide staircase to meet her for no other word could describe nurse marks's rolling and peculiar gait she is the most wonderful little old woman i have ever seen wrote waveney in her first letter home if you were to dress her in a red cloak and peaked hat she would make an excellent mother hubbard or the old woman who lived in her shoe or that ambitious old person who tried to brush the cobwebs from the sky to see her poking that long nose of hers into corners is quite killing she has bright eyes like a dormouse and a cosy voice do you know what i mean by that and she wears the funniest cap with a black bow at the top but there you must see her for yourself 
my ladies are out dearie she began at once rather breathlessly miss doreen is at the home and mrs mainwaring has sent for miss althea unexpectedly to go to some grand at home but she will be back to dinner and she begged that you would excuse her absence and i am going to take you to my room and give you some tea for you are tired dearie i know and then nurse marks led the way upstairs and waveney followed feeling as though she were the heroine of a fairy story and that some benevolent fairy had her in tow my ladies always calls this the cubby house observed nurse marks in a proud tone and to my thinking it is the nicest room in the house though it is odd-shaped as mitchell says and a trifle low it was oddly shaped indeed one corner had been cut off and the window a wide one had been set in an extraordinary angle so that part of the room was insufficiently lighted here there was a large japanese screen which hid the bed and washstand a round table was in the centre of the room and an old carved wardrobe and a nursery cupboard occupied the wall space some comfortable-looking rocking-chairs and a worn old couch gave it a cosy aspect but the chief feature of the room was the number of photographs and water-colour paintings that covered the walls while framed ones stood by dozens on the mantelpiece and chest of drawers one of them at once attracted waveney why that is the corporal she said in surprise corporal marks i mean and she spoke in puzzled tones ay that's jonadab returned nurse marks complacently it is a grand picture and his medals come out finely dinah thought a heap of that photo and then the bright dormouse eyes looked at waveney curiously well it beats me that you should know brother jonadab after all the world is not so big as we think it of course i know corporal marks returned waveney excitedly but there was a lump in her throat too at the sight of the little corporal's familiar face with its round surprised eyes and shock of grey hair and i know sergeant mcgill too then at the mention of mcgill nurse marks sat down and indulged in a hearty laugh well now if that is not like a book and you are the young lady that jonadab is always telling about is it not comfortable to know that their good works do follow them that's true even in this world for it stands to reason that things can't be hidden for ever sit down dearie and i will pour you out some tea you are a bit homesick and strange but that will pass so keep up your heart dear lamb and nurse marks poked her long nose into the teapot for she was short-sighted and waveney watched her a little anxiously but she need not have feared nurse marks was a clever woman and could always measure her distances accurately ah he is a grand man mcgill she remarked as she cut some delicate bread and butter with a practised hand but he is not long for this world jonadab will miss him sorely i fear they are a queer pair to look at them but they are just bound up in each other they are like a couple of old children i tell them they quarrel just for the sake of making it up but there as dinah used to say poor thing her man was fine at argifying was dinah your brother's wife ay dearie and jonadab thought a deal of her and grieved sore when the dear lord took her you will be wondering at his name maybe for it is out of the common is jonadab but mother used to tell us that when the boy came father was so proud and pleased that he went at once to the bible for a name and presently he came to mother looking as pleased as possible as though he had found a treasure rachel he says in a loud voice there is not a finer fellow to my thinking than jonadab the son of rechab and he was dead against the drink too and it is jonadab that we will call him and so jonadab it was finished nurse marks complacently End of chapter eleven chapter twelve of molly's prince this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org molly's prince by rosa nuchette carey chapter twelve the pansy room and cosy nook there is rosemary that is for remembrance and there is pansies that's for thoughts shakespeare that way madness lies let me shun that king lear it was impossible for waveney not to be amused by nurse mark's quaint tales 
her sense of humour was too strong and the atmosphere of the cubby-house was so full of comfort that in spite of herself her sad face began to brighten if you knew sergeant mcgill she said presently perhaps you knew his sweetheart sheila too then nurse marks smiled and nodded as she cut another appetising slice of bread and butter and laid it on waveney's plate such sweet home-made bread and fresh creamy butter ay dearie i knew sheila mctavish well for when i was a slip of a girl i had a bad illness and my mother's cousin effie stewart took me back with her to the highlands to bide with her for more than a year the mctavish cottage was next to ours and not a day passed that i did not see sheila coming up from the lock side with her creel with her bare feet and red petticoat and maybe a plaid over her bonny brown hair i was always a homely body even in my young days but never before or since have i seen a lovelier face than sheila mctavish the flower of the d side that was what they called her was she engaged to mcgill then ay my dearie she had broken the sixpence with him but he was away in india then i remember one day as i sat on the churchyard wall sheila came over the moor and she had a sprig of white heather in her hand she held it up to me with a smile it is good luck kezia she said and her eyes seemed full of brown sunshine and this morning i have heard from fergus mcgill himself and it is he who is the good lad with his letters he is coming home he says and then we are to be wed and it is the white heather that will bring us luck ah dearie before three weeks were over sheila our sweet flower of the d side lay in her coffin and they put the white heather on her dead breast and when fergus mcgill came home there was only the grave under the rowan tree there there it is a queer world finished nurse marks and there is many a love story left unfinished for man and woman too is born into trouble and i know that the women get the worst of it sometimes for it stands to reason continued the old woman garrulously that they think a deal more of a love tale now as we have finished tea shall i take you to your room my dearie it is called the pansy room and is close to mine miss althea is a grand one for giving names all the bedrooms are called after flowers to match the paper and cretonne there is the rose room and the forget-me-not and the pink room and the leafy room and the marigold room where they put gentlemen which is miss althea's asked waveney quickly oh the rose room miss althea has a passion for roses miss doreen sleeps in the forget-me-not room everything is blue there the other rooms are for their guests but near the servants quarters there are two pretty little attics called faith and charity where they put shop girls who have broken down and need a rest and these are never empty all the year round there is a little sitting-room attached where they take their meals there they are crossing the tennis lawn this moment from the porch house the tall one is laura cairns she has had an operation and has only just left the hospital and the little fat one is ellen sturt there is not much the matter with her except hard work and too much standing oh how good they are thought waveney as nurse marks bundled down the passage before her every one seems to have something to say in their praise even the cab-driver and then she looked round the pansy room well pleased it was so fresh and dainty and pretty and after her room at cleveland terrace so luxuriously comfortable for there was actually a cosy-looking couch and an easy chair and beautiful flowers on the toilet table and some hanging bookshelves full of interesting books the window looked over the tennis lawn with the porch house where the girls were pacing arm in arm one of them looked up at the window and smiled a little as waveney gazed down at her nurse marks who was already beginning to unpack went on talking briskly it was miss althea's thought but miss doreen helped her to carry it out 
it is always like that with my ladies they are just the two halves of a pair of scissors but they work together finely what one says the other does it is like the precious ointment that's what it is miss ward my dear and never a misunderstanding or a contrary word between them the girls come for a month and sometimes they stay longer and if they are well enough they wait on themselves or if not reynolds the under housemaid sees to them and when the weather permits they are in the garden or on the common the whole day long and they have the run of the porch house too and help themselves to books from the library they are no trouble and fall in with our ways and the blessing the red house is to some of those poor things is past my telling now dearie shall i hang these things in the wardrobe for you there is plenty of room and to spare and then i will go back and finish a bit of mending for miss althea waveney was not sorry to be left alone she wanted to begin a letter to molly she had so much already to tell her so she sat down at the writing-table and her pen flew over the paper until a quick light tap at her door roused her and miss althea entered waveney gave a vivid description of her to molly afterwards she looked so grand and stately that i felt quite shy but her dress was charming it was a soft cloudy grey but it shimmered as though it were streaked with silver and she had a close little bonnet that looked like silver too and a ruff of fine cobwebby lace round her long neck i fancy she always wears a ruff and she looked more like queen bess than ever somehow she is oddly picturesque and makes other people look commonplace beside her but there you must see her one day for yourself althea came up to the writing-table as waveney rose a little confused and held out her hand to the girl with one of her winning smiles i was so sorry to be out when you arrived she said kindly but my aunt mrs mainwaring sent for me most unexpectedly i hope nurse marks took good care of you oh yes returned waveney shyly she was very kind oh my dear old nurse is the kindest creature in the world she literally bubbles over with benevolence is not the cubby house delightful did you see the toy cupboard where all our dear old dolls and toys are stored marks won't part with one of them she is quite huffy if we propose to give them away when children come to the house she lets them play with them under her own eye one day she came into the library with a long face to tell me that little audrey neale had broken Bo peep's arm and althea laughed quite merrily then she looked at the clock on the mantelpiece and uttered an exclamation half past seven and i am not dressed what will peachy say i will come back and fetch you directly the gong sounds and then waveney was left to finish her letter she did not see miss doreen until they entered the dining-room and then she welcomed her very cordially to waveney the dinner-table was a revelation she had never taken a meal out of her own home and the soft shaded lights the hot-house fruits and flowers the handsome silver and the fineness of the damask excited her wonderment the servant moved so noiselessly over the thick carpets and then she thought of anne stumping round the table in her heavy boots ah they would be just sitting down to supper and molly would be mixing the salad as usual for everard ward had learnt to enjoy a salad in his paris days and would sup contentedly on bread and cheese or even bread and butter if only he could have a handful of cress or a stalk or two of endive to give it a relish doreen and althea were quite aware that the forlorn little stranger was not at her ease the small childish face looked subdued and thoughtful and the dark spirituelle eyes were sad in their wistfulness but with their usual tact and kindness they left her alone and talked to each other in their cheerful way 
althea gave a description of her afternoon party which was full of gentle humour and irene had a great deal to say about the home she had had tea with old mrs wheeler and as usual the poor old soul was full of her grievances against miss mason she is a cantankerous east windy sort of body went on doreen with a laugh as she helped herself to some grapes and she leads poor miss mason a life but there one must not judge her she has led a hard grinding sort of existence althea these grapes are unusually fine don't you think laura cairns would enjoy some ellen likes pears better and then doreen heaped up a plate with fine fruit and bade mitchell take it to the brown parlour when the sisters rose from the table althea touched waveney's arm come with me to the library she said in a kind voice we shall sit there this evening we do not often use the drawing-room it is a very big room and we always feel rather lost in it i call this big too remarked waveney in rather an awed voice she had never seen such a beautiful room in her life it was better than any of the dream rooms at kitlands the grand oriel window with its cushioned seat the carved oak furniture and bookcases filled with handsomely bound books the fine engravings on the walls all excited her admiration but when althea drew back a curtain and showed her a tiny room hidden away behind it with a glass door opening on the terrace she could not refrain from an exclamation of delight oh what a dear little room she said quite naturally yes i call it my cosy nook but it is not really a room it is merely a recess and waveney thought how well miss althea's name suited it there was a small writing-table prettily fitted up an easy chair and a work-table i am so glad you have taken a fancy to it went on miss althea and she looked very much pleased because this is to be your little sanctum you see it would never do for me to have my reader and companion far away from me and yet i imagine we should both find it irksome to be always together even my sister and i could not stand that but you see when the curtain is dropped you will be quite private and it is really for me and waveney's eyes sparkled with pleasure then miss althea smiled and put her hand kindly on the girl's arm i want you to be happy with us my dear and not to look upon us as strangers because in the old days your father was a dear friend of ours last night an idea struck me do you think you would feel more at home with us if we were to call you by your christian name you have such a pretty name and it is so uncommon oh please do returned waveney flushing with shy pleasure it was silly of me but i was so dreading that miss ward and somehow a load seemed lifted off her at that moment she is such a little childish thing observed miss althea afterwards and yet she has plenty of character we are very unconventional people doreen you and i but i never could endure these artificial barriers my dignity such as it is is innate it does not need bolstering up i could not be stiff and proper with everard ward's daughter and then a strangely sad look came into althea's eyes as though some ghost from the past had crossed her path no certainly not to everard ward's daughter and doreen smiled as though she understood her doreen's world was inhabited by warm-blooded human beings no ghostly visitants ever haunted her i am a woman without a story she would say most people have some sort of romance in their lives even unmarried women have their unfinished idols but my life has been bare prose but she always laughed when she made these speeches for there was nothing morbid in doreen's character althea proposed as the evening was mild and balmy that they should take a turn in the garden 
it will be very pleasant on the terrace and in the kitchen garden she remarked but of course we must avoid the grass are not these shut-in lawns pretty through that arch if it were light enough you would have a glimpse of my flower-garden i call it mine because i give it my special supervision doreen takes more interest in the kitchen garden and when i boast of my roses and begonias she is dilating on the excellence of her strawberries and tomatoes i think i should care most for the flower garden observed waveney and then of her own accord she began telling miss althea about the pensioners little gardens and the corporal's flowers althea listened with much interest and then little by little her quiet questions and sympathetic manner induced waveney to break through her shy reserve and speak of her home althea soon found out all she wanted to know the home that was so perfect in waveney's eyes the little warm nest that held all her dear ones seemed meagre and bare to the elder woman who had been used to luxury all her life and had never had a want ungratified as the girl talked on in a naive way all at once a vision rose before althea's eyes of a brilliantly lighted ballroom and of a fair boyish-looking man with stephanotis in his buttonhole standing before her with eager looks it is our valse althea and i have been looking forward to it all the evening and then and then but she started from her reverie with a quick feeling of shame why had these thoughts come to her he was dorothy's lover not hers had he ever cared for her really it was all a mistake it was not he who was to blame it was i i and even in the september darkness she smote her hands angrily together the love had been in her imagination it had never existed never she had bartered her warm woman's heart for a shadow and alas alas it was not in althea's nature to change if i love once i love for ever she had once said in a bitter moment to doreen how she repented that speech afterwards no you do not understand neither do i but i think it is my nature to be faithful when althea roused from her brooding she found that waveney had become silent you were speaking of your sister were you not she said gently some one told me she continued a little vaguely that she was very pretty oh yes returned waveney eagerly every one thinks molly quite lovely it is such a pity she is lame it spoils things so much for her poor darling but people admire her just the same in the street they turn round and stare at her but molly never seems to notice them a bit that reminds me of such a funny speech and here waveney began to laugh an old irish woman who works for us sometimes once said to her it is my belief miss molly darlint that the powers above were after fashioning an angel and then they thought better of it and changed it into a flesh-and-blood woman for the angel still laughs out of your eyes ma vornin and would you believe it miss harford that molly only burst out laughing when biddy said that but i think it was beautiful i must see your pretty molly returned althea thoughtfully but we must go in now i think i must tell moritz that she said to herself with a smile the angel still laughs out of your eyes ma vornin how very like an irish woman End of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of molly's prince this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org molly's prince by rosa newshet carey chapter thirteen concerning guardian angels and ethereal spear though many a year has o'er us rolled since life's bright morning-tide 
i'm dreaming still the dream of old we once dreamt side by side helen marion burnside it had been a long trying day to waveney and it was a great relief when she found herself again in the pansy room it was still early in the evening but as soon as the door had closed upon the girl althea rose from her chair i have had a tiring afternoon dory she said in rather a weary voice a well-dressed crush always flattens me so many smart bonnets and so few brains somehow society always reminds me of a trifle all sweetness and froth aren't you a little mixed althea returned her sister good-humouredly there is froth certainly but in my experience there is plenty of richness and sweetness underneath if you only dig deep enough oh i dare say and then a droll idea came to althea and she laughed softly don't you remember the gingerbread queens that we used to buy when we were children at the medhurst fair and how angry i was when someone stripped the gilt off i thought it was real gold like nebuchadnezzar's image well some of those fine ladies reminded me of the gingerbread queens doreen looked amused you are in a pessimistic mood dear then she put her hands on her sister's shoulders and scrutinized her face a little anxiously you are very tired are your eyes paining you althea no dear but i think i shall go to bed but when she had left the room doreen did not at once resume her book i wonder what is troubling her she said to herself i know her expression so well and with all her little jokes she is not at ease i hope that we have not made a grievous mistake in engaging miss ward and yet she seems a nice little thing but there is a look in althea's eyes to-night as though she had seen a ghost when one is no longer young the ghosts will come and then doreen sighed and took up her book althea was very tired but it was mental not bodily fatigue that had brought the dark shadows under her eyes but it was not her habit to spare herself or to shunt her duties so instead of going straight to her room she turned down the passage that led to the two little chambers where their humbler guests slept and sat for a few minutes beside laura cairn's bed the girl slept badly and althea's sympathetic nature guessed intuitively how a few cheering words would sweeten the long night and she never missed her evening visit it is better to lie awake in the country than in tottenham court roads she said presently then laura smiled oh yes miss harford it is so heavenly the peace and silence but at first it almost startled me in london the cabs and carts are always passing and there seems no quiet at all but here one can lie and think of the birds in their nests and how good it is to be free from pain oh i am so much better and it is all owing to your kindness and this dear old place and here the girl's lips rested for a moment on the kind hand that held hers but you will not leave me without my message miss harford for it was one of althea's habits to give what she called night thoughts to the sick girls who came to the red house althea paused a moment for once she had forgotten it then some words of thomas a kempis came to her seek not much rest but much patience and she repeated them softly will that do laura oh yes and thank you so much miss harford not much rest but much patience i must remember that i must remember it too thought althea and then she went to the cubby house to bid her old nurse good-night and to have a little chat with her nurse marks was loud in her praises of waveney i like her miss althea my dear she said eagerly she has pretty manners and a good heart dear dear just to think of it being jonadab's young lady he thinks a deal of her does jonadab she will be a comfort to you my dearie but there you are looking weary my lamb and peachy will be waiting to brush your hair and althea was thankful to be dismissed she sent peachy away as soon as possible and then sat down in an easy chair by the window 
her eyes were aching but the darkness rested them she was a good sleeper generally but to-night she knew that no wooing of the drowsy god would avail her doreen was right and the ghost of the past had suddenly started up in her path althea's youth had been a very happy one until the day when she and everard ward had gathered peaches together in the walled garden at kitlands and then it had seemed to her as though they were the very apples of sodom mere dust and ashes everard had judged his own case far too leniently he had been eager to clear himself from blame a young fellow has his fancies before he settles down finally he would say in his careless way oh yes you are right edgerton i was sweet on althea harford there was something fascinating about her she was rather fetching and picturesque you know what i mean but dorothy well it was love at first sight the real thing and no mistake i wanted to ask her to marry me that very first evening only i could not do it you know i suppose not returned his friend dryly you are a cool hand everard upon my word i wonder what miss harford thought about it all perhaps i am a bit old-fashioned but in my day we did not think it good form to pay court to one girl and marry another but this plain speaking only offended everard probably because in his inner consciousness he knew the older man had spoken the truth through the sweet spring days and the glorious months of summer everard ward had wooed the young heiress with the eager persistence that was natural to him althea's fascinating personality her gentleness and bright intelligence all dominated the young man and for a time at least he honestly believed himself in love with her he was not fickle by nature and if dorothy sinclair had not crossed his path and played rosalind to his orlando in the green glades of kitlands park he would to a certainty have married althea harford hearts do not break they say but when althea walked down the terrace steps that day with her basket of peaches on her arm she knew that the gladness and sweetness of her young life had faded and that if her heart were not actually broken it was only because her unselfishness and sense of right forbade such wreckage i shall live through it dory she had said to her sister in those early days of misery and god helping me it shall not make me bitter but it has robbed me of my youth one cannot suffer in this way and keep young and she was right if you could only hate him ejaculated doreen in your circumstances i know i should loathe and despise him but althea only shook her head how could i hate him when i have grown to love him with my whole heart when i have regarded myself as his but here she stopped and hid her face in her hands with a choking sob oh dory that is the worst of all that i should have believed it and that he never meant it that he never really loved me i think he was very fond of you althea returned doreen eagerly mother was saying so only last night yes he was fond of me we were friends but i was not his closest and dearest dory we must never talk of this again you and i a wound like this so sore and deep should be covered up and hidden i must hide it even from myself there is only one thing that i want to say and then we will bury our dead i cannot hate everard hatred is not in my nature and neither can i ever cease to love him oh there is no need for you to look so shocked as doreen's face expressed strong disapproval of this there will be no impropriety in the love i shall bear him if i could i would be his guardian angel and keep all troubles from him then she sighed and put her hand gently on her sister's shoulder seek not much rest but much patience that shall be my new year's motto we will bury our dead those had been her words and for twenty years the grass had grown over that grave and yet on this september night the ghost of her old love had haunted her and the ache of the old pain had made itself felt is there any grave deep enough to bury a woman's love 
althea harford was nearly forty-one and yet the memory of everard ward with his perfect face and boyish winning ways his gay insouciance and light-hearted mirth made her heart throb with quickened beats of pain all these years these weary years she had never met any one like him never any one whom she could compare with him people had often told her that he was not specially clever that his talents were by no means of a first-class order but she had never believed them to her fond fancy he was the embodiment of every manly gift and beauty even dorothy with all her love for her husband would have marvelled at althea's infatuation and now everard's daughter was under her roof and the knowledge that this was so had driven the sleep from her eyes and filled her with a strange restlessness waveney's smile and the turn of her head and something in her voice recalled everard more than once that evening she had winced as some familiar tone brought him too vividly before her waveney's artless confidence had given her food for thought she had long known the hard fight that everard ward was waging in his attempts to keep the wolf from the door on more than one occasion her secret beneficence had lightened his weight of care if everard had guessed who was the real purchaser of some of his pictures he would not have pocketed the money quite so happily but althea kept her own counsel if i could only be his guardian angel she had said in her girlish misery and no pure wish had ever been expressed by woman's lips in some way she had been everard ward's good angel all these years still she had never realized the extent of his poverty until waveney had told her about the purchase of king canute a friend of mr ingram's wanted a historical picture and it was so fortunate that he took a fancy to king canute he had actually paid five-and-twenty guineas and they had paid off the disagreeable butcher and now father would have the new greatcoat that he wanted so badly waveney had said all this with girlish frankness as she and her new friend had paced up and down the garden path in the september darkness but althea had made no answer she only shivered a little as though she were cold and a few minutes later she proposed to return to the house it is a beautiful evening but we must not forget that it is september she had observed but her voice was a little strained no she had never really realized until that moment how badly things had gone with him that mention of the great coat had effectually opened her eyes and then as though to mock her a little scene rose before her a certain golden afternoon spent in an old studio at chelsea where everard ward and a friend had established themselves how well she remembered it and the balcony full of flowers overlooking the river with a gay awning overhead it was summer-time and she had put on a white gown in honour of the occasion and everard had brought her a cluster of dark velvety roses they will give you the colour you need he had said looking at her admiringly what an ideal artist he had seemed to her in his brown velveteen coat the yellow sunshine seemed to make a halo round his fair hair you look like a glorified angel ward his friend had said laughingly what do you say miss harford would he not do for ethereal in my picture of adam and eve sleeping in paradise with the evil one whispering in eve's ear do you remember the passage him thus intent ethereal with his spear touched lightly look here old man you must sit for me to-morrow but everard had only grumbled and looked bored in those days great coats had certainly not been lacking and as this thought occurred to her althea had shivered and become silent about four-and-twenty hours later molly received the following letter which she carried off to her bedroom and read over and over again she had already had the note in which waveney had described the cubby-house and her pansy room and molly had certainly not expected another so soon my own sweetheart here i am actually writing to you again but i know what a long weary day this has been and how my sweet moll has been missing me and i said to myself 
a letter by the last post will send her to sleep happily and make her think that we are not so far apart after all well and how do you think i have been spending my first day of servitude why all by myself on the common and if you had been there it would have been simply perfect the common is such a beautiful place and it stretches away for miles but you will be saying to yourself is this the way miss harford's reader performs her duties my dear child i have not seen my miss harford to-day at breakfast time miss doreen told me that her sister had had a bad night and that she was suffering great pain in her eyes it is so severe an attack she explained that she cannot bear a vestige of light and reading would drive her distracted her maid peachy is looking after her and most likely by evening the pain will have worn itself out and then she advised me to take a book out of the library and sit on the common as she would be absent the greater part of the day it was rather a business choosing a book but i took ayala's angel at last as it looked amusing and angels always remind me of my molly there is that not a pretty speech the two little yorkshire terriers accompanied me fuss and fury they are such dear little fellows and it was just lovely there was a little green nook with a comfortable bench a little way back from the road and there i spent the morning miss doreen was still at the house so i had luncheon alone and afterwards i went out in the garden the two shop-girls were there they had hammock chairs under a tree the tall pale girl was working and the other was reading to her i stopped to speak to them and then i found a delightful seat in the kitchen garden it was so warm and sunny that you would have thought it was august mitchell came to tell me when tea was ready and now i am up in my pansy room writing to you there is a pillar box quite near and when i have finished it i shall slip out and post it and then a few loving messages to her father and noel closed the letter End of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of molly's prince this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org molly's prince by rosa newshet carey chapter fourteen thursdays at the porch house and touched by her fair tendance gladlier grew milton when waveney crossed the hall after posting her letter the dressing-bell rang and mitchell who encountered her on the stairs informed her with quiet civility that both her mistresses were in the library and had desired that she would join them as soon as she was ready it did not take many minutes for waveney to brush out her curly hair and put on her white dress it was almost severe in its simplicity and absence of trimming but in hers and molly's eyes it was a garment fit for a princess and when waveney had pinched up the lace ruffles and put in the little pearl brooch which had belonged to her mother she was innocently pleased with her appearance she had rather a shock when she entered the library doreen was not there but althea was sitting with her back to the light with a green shade over her eyes the pale tints of her gown waveney discovered she always wore soft neutral tints the pallor of her long thin face and the disguising shade gave her a strangely pathetic look she held out her hand with a faint smile i am so sorry my dear that this should have happened and on your first day too it is the worst attack i have had for months and no remedies seem to have any effect but the pain is gone now and to-morrow i shall be myself again oh i am so glad of that i am glad of it too returned althea for i would not willingly miss one of our thursday evenings you will be surprised to hear that we have begun a course of shakespeare readings some of the girls are so intelligent and read so well our old friend mr chater helps us he is a barrister but a very poor one i am sorry to say but he is wonderfully clever 
he used to read to the girls then he got up an elocution class and now he has started these shakespeare readings and the girls do so enjoy them it sounds very nice i think you will say so we have had tempest and twelfth night and to-morrow it is to be as you like it mr chater is to be touchstone and the melancholy jacques rather contrasts are they not at this moment doreen re-entered she looked pleased as she noticed the animation in her sister's voice and as the gong sounded she said you will like miss ward to come and talk after dinner althea while i write those letters and althea smiled and nodded she looks very ill waveney said in a low voice as they walked down the corridor oh yes returned miss harford she always looks bad after one of these attacks it is the pain you see my sister does not bear pain well it wears her out waveney felt relieved when dinner was over doreen was very kind and pleasant but she was not a great talker and hardly knew how to interest her young companion girls were more in althea's line she said to herself althea had such marvellous sympathy and understood them so thoroughly she herself got on better with older women and once or twice she smiled in an amused way when she lifted her eyes from her plate and saw the little figure in white opposite her she reminded me of one of moritz's pictures she said afterwards to althea whichever could it be i have been puzzling myself all dinner-time the white frock makes her look more like a child than ever her eyes are lovely but she is not pretty not exactly but i like her face i expect you mean that picture of undine yes she is wonderfully like it only this undine has her soul by the by we have not seen moritz for an age i shall write to gwendolen and tell her that her boy is up to mischief when waveney returned to the library she found that one or two shaded lamps had been lighted but that althea was still seated in the darkest corner of the room she bade waveney draw up a chair beside her my head is too confused to listen to reading she observed so you shall just talk and amuse me tell me anything about yourself or molly or your brother everything human interests me and nothing in the world pleases me better than to listen to the story of other people's lives waveney laughed but she was a little embarrassed too shall i tell you about my dear old men at the hospital she said rather nervously and althea concealed her disappointment and said yes certainly tell me anything you like and so waveney began and as usual her narrative was very picturesque and graphic but lo and behold before many minutes were over she had crossed the green sward and the lime avenue and was standing in fancy before a certain high narrow house with vine-draped balcony and an old courtyard and as she talked her eyes were shining with eagerness and now the beloved names were on her lips father and molly and noel althea almost held her breath as she listened oh we were so happy exclaimed the girl i think no one could have been happier we were never dull not even when noel was at school and father away but of course we liked the evenings best oh yes of course echoed althea softly i think the winter evenings were best returned waveney reflectively because we could make up such a lovely fire father was often cold and tired but he always smiled when he saw our fire and sometimes we would roast chestnuts that was noel's treat and tell stories and sing father has such a beautiful voice and so has molly and when they sing in church people look round and wonder who they are your brother is happy at school then happy i should think so he is so clever even his masters say so and then he never shirks his work like other boys oh do you know miss harford he has set his heart on getting a scholarship he is working for his examination now if he gets it we hope he will be able to go to oxford for he does so want to be a barrister 
but my dear eighty pounds a year would not pay his expenses at any university and then althea bit her lip as though she had said more than she intended oh we know that returned waveney eagerly but we thought at least noel thought that perhaps the veiled prophet and then she broke into a laugh how absurd i am as though you could understand but noel is always so ridiculous and gives such funny names to people the veiled prophet is that kind friend of mother's who has sent him to st paul's a friend of your mother's my dear althea's tone was a little perplexed father always says it is some friend of mother's but of course it is all guesswork the lawyer who pays his bills tells us nothing and then partly to amuse her hearer and partly because it gave her pleasure to narrate anecdotes of the lad's cleverness and sense of humour she told her how noel intended one day to go to lincoln's inn and interview the old lawyer and there was something so racy in the girl's manner and she imitated noel's voice so well that althea who had been trying to suppress her amusement for some minutes gave up the effort and broke into a hearty laugh my dear you have done me good she said when they were serious again and my evening thanks to you has passed very pleasantly but i am going to send you away now as i must not talk any more and then as waveney rose from her chair at this dismissal she drew her gently towards her and kissed her cheek i am your friend remember that waveney she said in her quiet voice and the girl blushed with surprise and pleasure the next morning waveney was summoned to the library she found althea looking pale and weak but she had discarded her shade she was resting in a deep easy chair and her lap was full of letters waveney found that her work was cut out for her and for more than an hour she was busily engaged in writing the answers dictated to her one was to mrs wainwaring and waveney felt great pleasure in writing it she had not forgotten fairy magnificent she had taken a fancy to the pretty old lady and longed to see her again when althea had finished her correspondence she put a volume of robert browning's life into the girl's hand i must not use my eyes to-day she said with a sigh so if you will be good enough to read to me i will finish my jersey knitting and crochet are my only amusements on my blind days we work for the seaman's mission and then she added brightly it is such a luxury having some one to read to me we shall get through so many nice books you and i the morning passed so quickly that both of them were surprised when the gong sounded after luncheon waveney was told to go out and amuse herself until tea-time and she spent a delightful afternoon rambling over the common with fuss and fury frolicking beside her the little terriers evidently regarded her as a new playmate and were on the friendliest terms with her on going up to her room to dress for dinner which was always an hour earlier on thursdays she noticed a group of girls in the veranda of the porch house some were sitting down and others standing about with rackets in their hands through the open window she could hear merry voices and laughter laura cairns and the other girl were with them the young housemaid who waited on her volunteered an explanation as she set down the hot water can those are the young ladies from the durham shops ma'am it is early closing day with most of them and they come up early to play tennis althea looked amused when waveney repeated this speech they are young ladies to dorcas she said laughing but indeed some of these girls are so intelligent and so truly refined that one need not grudge them the term one or two of them would grace any drawing-room but of course we have our dressy smart girls too by the by waveney do you play tennis and as waveney shook her head i thought not the houses in cleveland terrace have only small gardens and you would have no opportunity of practising but i am a devout believer in tennis mollie and i always longed to play returned waveney with a sigh but of course it was out of the question for mollie yes but it is quite possible for you and if you like nora greenwell will teach you she is our crack player 
even my sister who is severely critical allows that she makes wonderful strokes eh dory she plays exceedingly well returned doreen looking up from a scrap-book she was making for a children's hospital but then miss greenwell does everything well she is to take rosalind's part to-night is she not althea winced slightly as doreen asked the question to her dying day she would never hear rosalind's part read or acted without secret emotion she had dreaded this evening ever since the play of as you like it was decided upon but none the less she had determined to be present yes she returned rather hastily of course mr chater selected that part for her as nora is certainly our best reader minnie alston will be celia and then she turned to waveney they are my two favourites when my sister wishes to tease me she calls them my two paragons and indeed i am proud of them oddly enough they serve in the same shop that big haberdasher gardiner and wells miss ward has not passed the shop althea she has yet to make acquaintance with derham why do you call her miss ward returned althea playfully it is far too stiff a name for her follow my example and call her waveney but doreen looked a little dubious at this she was a kind-hearted woman but an undemonstrative one and her sister's pretty speeches and little caressing ways often filled her with envy dinner that evening was rather hurried and the moment it was over althea took up a light wrap and invited waveney to accompany her to the porch-house the girls had finished their tea and were now arranging the room for their reading althea paused doubtfully on the threshold as she heard the commotion we are a little early she said and they never like me to find them in confusion i will show you the kitchen waveney is this not a nice little place and that room beyond is where the girls wash their hands and brush their hair there is a storeroom too where i keep my jams and cake a pale-faced young widow was washing up the teacups as they entered she brightened up as althea addressed her that is my caretaker mrs shaw observed althea in a low voice come they are fairly quiet now and we may as well go in as mr chater is generally punctual waveney felt a little shy as she followed althea the great room seemed full of girls there were thirty or forty of them but althea shook hands with every one and had a pleasant word for each this is my friend miss ward she said in her clear voice to the assembled girls nora singling out a tall girl with an interesting face i am going to ask you to teach miss ward to play tennis the asphalt court behind the porch house will soon be ready thanks to the early closing movement some of you will be able to have a game before it gets dark yes indeed miss harford and we can practise our skating too interposed a pretty dark girl waveney found out afterwards that it was minnie alston and that she and nora were great chums that will be charming returned althea she looked more like queen bess than ever as she stood in the circle of girls with the light shining on her ruddy hair and soft ruffles now girls we must take our places and then she beckoned waveney to a long high-backed settle that stood by the fire the room was large and a little cold so a fire had been lighted waveney looked round with intense interest the recreation hall as it was called was of noble dimensions and evidently well lighted from the number of windows there was a platform at one end with a piano and two or three easels and half a dozen round tables with gay crimson cloths occupied the centre of the room these were at once surrounded by groups of girls some with books in their hands the floor was stained and some warm-coloured rugs gave an air of comfort a well-filled bookcase a few well-chosen prints and a carved oak chair known as miss harford's throne comprised the remainder of the furniture this evening althea had vacated her throne for the settle and a few minutes later doreen entered the room and with a pleasant nod to the girl she seated herself by her sister althea looked pleased but she was evidently surprised 
waveney discovered afterwards that it was not miss harford's habit to attend the thursday meetings the sisters had their different hobbies doreen's active energies found plenty of scope in her home for broken-down workers and though althea had contributed largely to it and always visited it at least once a week it was doreen who was the head and mainspring of the whole concern the committee of management comprised of a few personal friends in the neighbourhood were merely tools in her vigorous hands i wanted to hear miss greenwell's rosalind she whispered and then a man's step sounded in the little passage there was a quick rap at the door the girls all rose from their seats and althea went forward with a smile of welcome you are punctual to a minute thorold she said as she shook hands miss ward this is our old friend mr chater but as waveney bowed demurely a sudden gleam of amusement sparkled in her eyes for lo and behold it was the noticeable man with large grey eyes who had inquired the way in ranelagh gardens End of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of molly's prince this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org molly's prince by rosa newshed carey chapter fifteen orlando to the rescue macbeth if we should fail lady macbeth we fail but screw your courage to the sticking-place and we'll not fail shakespeare waveney was secretly piqued to see that there was no sign of recognition in mr chater's eyes he bowed as though to a stranger in whom he took slight interest exchanged a few words with the sisters looked at his watch and then lifted his hand as a signal for silence and the buzzing girlish voices were instantly hushed the readers had already taken their places round the centre table miss harford's throne and a reading desk stood beside it the rest of the girls had grouped themselves round the tables with their work a few of them had a volume of shakespeare in their hands the moment after mr chater's entrance one of the girls had left the room rather hurriedly and a minute later althea was summoned mr chater was giving a few instructions in a low voice and had not noticed the circumstance until althea returned with a perturbed countenance i am so sorry she said in a tone of vexation it is most unfortunate but miss pearson has one of her giddy attacks and is obliged to go home she is in tears about it but as i tell her it is no fault of hers mr chater looked blank his audience was impatient already he had heard sundry thimbles rap the table and his readers were eager to begin but now there was no orlando what was to be done such failure was not to be borne he frowned considered the point and then looked persuasively at althea if you will be so good he began but althea shook her head and turned a little pale not for worlds would she have read that part to her relief doreen came to her aid you must not ask althea she said in her quick decided way she was quite ill yesterday and her head is not right to-day i wish i could help you but i am no reader as you know but there is miss ward i think she would do nicely you will help them will you not turning to waveney poor waveney was ready to sink through the ground she grew hot and then cold do try dear althea whispered coaxingly and to her dismay she found mr chater's grave intent look fixed on her the clear grey eyes were somewhat beseeching it will be a great kindness he said your audience will not be critical miss ward let me beg you to do us this favour it is impossible i should spoil everything stammered waveney in great distress i have only once read as you like it and that was a long time ago 
but she might as well have spoken to the wind mr chater evidently had a will of his own his only reply was to put a book in her hand and offer her a chair i have promised that we will not be critical he said quietly you will soon get into the swing of it to give you confidence i will read orlando's opening speech to adam then as waveney took her place with hot cheeks and downcast eyes a delightful clapping of hands welcomed her althea looked anxious as she returned to the oak settle poor little thing she is frightened to death she whispered but thorold was so masterful with her i like men to be masterful returned doreen in an undertone but i wish he would try it on with joanna and then they both smiled and althea said hush as mr chater's full rich tones were audible waveney's turn came all too soon her voice trembled and was sadly indistinct at first but as one girl after another took up her cue she soon forgot her nervousness and entered into the spirit of the play several of the girls read well but none of them equalled nora greenwell celia was passable and phoebe certainly understood her role but nora read with a sprightliness and animation that surprised waveney the girl seemed a born actor her enunciation was clear and the changes of expression in her voice its mirth and passion its rollicking girlish humours and droll witcheries were wonderfully rendered but it was mr chater's reading that kept waveney spellbound when as first lord he narrates the story of the melancholy jaques and the sobbing deer the pathos of his voice brought the tears to her eyes and as touchstone his dry humour and clownish wit were so cleverly given that once waveney laughed and was covered with confusion twice the reading was interrupted by a charming little interlude when three or four girls went up on the platform and sang under the greenwood tree and blow blow thou winter wind at the conclusion of the play which was shortened purposely althea took her seat at the piano and all the girls joined in an evening hymn waveney did not sing for her heart was full the evening's performance had excited her and her imagination which was always remarkably vivid seemed suddenly to grasp the full beauty and meaning of the scene was not this christian socialism in its fairest aspect she thought could any picture be sweeter or more symbolical than that group of young faces gathered round the two dear ladies for doreen was on the platform too some of the faces were far from being beautiful some were absolutely plain and one or two sickly-looking girls with tangled hair and decked out with cheap finery were singularly unattractive and yet as althea's long slim fingers touched the notes and the dear old tune that they had loved in childhood floated through the wide hall each face brightened into new life they are all workers thought waveney as she watched them some of them have hard toilsome lives they are away from their homes and amongst strangers and though they are so young they know weariness and heartache but when they come here it is like home to each one and it makes them happy if i were a shop girl at durham i should look forward to my thursday evening as i look forward to sunday and then she said to herself happily to-morrow i shall say the day after to-morrow and how delightful that will be waveney was smiling to herself when she suddenly raised her eyes and encountered mr chater's amused glance he had evidently been watching her for some time for he was leaning back in the carved armchair with the air of a man who felt he had earned his repose the next moment he came towards her the hymn was over but the girls were still gathered round althea and wishing her good-night under the cover of their voices he addressed waveney i have not properly thanked you for your kind assistance miss ward but i assure you that i was most grateful miss pearson's indisposition had placed us in an awkward dilemma but you came to our help most nobly i am afraid i acquitted myself badly returned waveney she would have given much for a word of praise people generally liked her reading but she feared that mr chater would be no ordinary critic 
you did very well he returned quietly indeed considering you had only once read the play i ought to give you greater praise you see shakespeare is a sort of divinity to me i think a lifetime is hardly long enough to study him properly my reverence for him makes me unreasonable orlando did not suit you you would have made a better rosalind if you were staying at the red house and liked to join my thursday evening classes i could give you a few valuable hints i should like to join them observed waveney colouring a little if miss harford could spare me and as he looked a little perplexed at this she added hastily i have come to the red house as miss althea's reader and companion and this explanation evidently satisfied him but the next moment as waveney was moving away he stopped her will you pardon me miss ward if i ask if we have ever met before i have a fancy that your voice he was going to say eyes but he checked himself is not quite unknown to me i have been puzzling over it half the evening oh yes we have met before returned waveney who was quite at her ease now it was in old ranelagh gardens and you asked us to direct you to dunedin terrace i hope you found it and he smiled assent to this you were with your sister he hazarded and waveney nodded and then doreen joined them and mr chater said no more of course he recalled it now and it was only last monday too but how was he to identify the little girl in her shabby hat with this dainty little figure in white true her eyes had attracted him that day but this evening he had not seen them fully until a few minutes ago he recalled everything now the beautiful face of the other girl and the sweet refined voices of both he had wondered who they were and why they were sitting hand in hand in the sunshine and looking so sad and it was only three days ago doreen proposed that waveney should come back with her to the house my sister and mr chater often stop behind for a little chat about the girls she explained and waveney glancing at them as she left the room saw that she was right althea had seated herself on the settle and was holding up a small screen between her face and the firelight and mr chater was standing with one arm leaning against the mantelpiece looking down at her i am so glad the reading went off so well she said when the door had closed after her sister and waveney at one moment i was terribly afraid until our little orlando came to the rescue she read very nicely thorold yes very fairly considering all things but the part did not suit her i hope you were proud of your pet protege i consider miss greenwell achieved a striking success to-night i am not easy to please but really once or twice i found myself saying bravo under my breath no as a critic you are terribly censorious thorold you will laugh at me but nora's cleverness and her undoubted talents almost frightened me what is the good of her learning all this euclid in french and robbing herself of some of her rest to get time for her studies if she is to spend her life in snipping off lengths of ribbon and tape from one end of the year to the other all the good in the world he returned in a most energetic tone why need the snipping of ribbon as you describe it interfere with the development of the higher life your argument is a weak one you might as well say that cutting muslin by the yard for so many hours at a stretch interferes with the religious life and yet i expect plenty of shop-women are good christians there was a flash of amusement in althea's eyes though she pretended to be indignant how absurd you are but i will not believe that you have so misunderstood me let me explain what i really do mean i am very proud of nora but i am so afraid that all this education and cultivation will make her discontented with her surroundings no life can be perfect that is out of harmony with its environment i know a dozen girls from gardner and wells and only one of them minnie alston is worthy of nora's friendship she is very lonely and as you know her home is most unsatisfactory a virago of a stepmother and a lot of boisterous children her work does not suit her but she dare not throw herself out of a situation yes i see what you mean returned mr chater gravely increase of knowledge often creates loneliness and one member of a family may move on a different plane where his relations cannot follow him but if they are sensible people they do not beg him to climb down to them and leave off his star-gazing i think we need not disquiet ourselves about miss greenwell perhaps she may have good things waiting for her mr chater spoke in an enigmatical tone he was grave and reticent by nature and some up-to-date people would have thought a few of his ideas antiquated he had a great dislike to any kind of gossip 
and never mentioned reports which reached him until they were actually verified some one had hinted to him that nora greenwell had found favour in the eyes of her employer's son robert gardiner was well educated and intelligent but his parents who were very proud of him wished him to marry well i have saved my pennies bob and when you think of taking a wife i shall buy a plot of ground in the mortimer road and build you a house but as mr gardiner said this he was thinking of his partner's only child annie wells she was a pretty fresh-looking girl and when her father died she would have six or seven thousand pounds for garden and wells drove a flourishing trade in durham if mr chater had mentioned this report to althea it would have thrown a little light on a circumstance that had come under her observation there had been a mistake in her quarterly account with gardiner wells and one thursday afternoon robert gardiner had walked up to the red house to speak to miss harford althea kept him waiting for ten minutes as she was entertaining a visitor but on entering the dining-room she found him standing at the window so intent on watching a game of tennis that she addressed him by name before she could gain his attention i beg your pardon miss harford he said hastily he was a fair good-looking man and almost gentlemanly in manner i was watching the game you have a capital tennis court so every one says miss greenwell is our best player she plays splendidly i never saw such strokes and all through the brief interview althea noticed how his eyes were following the girl's graceful movements if nora and minnie had not been playing i think i should have invited him to have a game she said afterwards to doreen but i thought of gardiner pere and was afraid i might shock his sense of propriety it would not have been good taste returned doreen sensibly you may depend upon it that robert gardiner has very little to do with the young ladies of the establishment and then they both laughed by the by althea observed mr chater when they had finished the subject of nora greenwell i am so glad you have taken your friend's advice and have engaged a reader i am sure miss ward will be a comfort to you i think so too she is very bright and intelligent and she talks in the most amusing way she is so natural and unsophisticated so i should imagine where did you pick her up doreen applied to an agency in harley street but thorold and here her voice changed what singular coincidences there are in life is it not strange that she should be everard ward's daughter mr chater was now sitting beside her and as she said this he turned round and looked at her he was evidently very much surprised i had no idea of that he said in a low tone there are so many wards such a thought would never have occurred to me and then he glanced at her keenly is it not a little awkward for you althea then a faint flush came to her cheek she was five or six years older than thorold but they had been old playfellows and dear friends and his brother had been one of althea's lovers in the kitland days and he knew all about the ward romance and lad as he was he had predicted its ending as he watched dorothy play the part of rosalind in the pastoral play i do not see why it should be awkward she observed quietly i have not met mr ward for twenty years but i should have no objection to do so to-morrow he is very poor thorold and i am afraid they are often in difficulties his pictures do not sell well perhaps they are not worth much i fancy ward's genius is purely imaginary none of his friends believe that he would do much as an artist well it is getting late and i am keeping you up and then doreen will scold me let me help you turn out the lights and then i will walk with you to the house it is a glorious night and i shall enjoy my stroll home but as they stood in the porch a moment in the starlight althea touched his arm how is joa she asked kindly she is quite well he returned joanna seldom ails anything but she is no happier poor soul i sometimes think she never will be then his voice grew suddenly tired i do not profess to understand women althea i suppose some natures are naturally depressed and live in an atmosphere of worry but they are scarcely pleasant housemates i am afraid that is hardly a brotherly speech and he laughed a little grimly as he shook hands poor thorold althea said to herself as she crossed the hall joa is the old man of the mountains to him she is a dead weight on him and yet how seldom he utters a word of complaint scarcely ever and only to me but he can say what he likes to me he knows i am a safe confidant End of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of molly's prince this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org 
Molly's Prince by Rosa Nouchette Carey Sir Reynard and the Grapes Her angel's face, as the great eye of heaven, shined bright and made a sunshine in the shady place. Spencer's Fairy Queen It is the opinion of certain wiseacres that enjoyment consists mainly in anticipation and retrospection, and that the actual pleasure is reduced to a minimum. But to Waveney, her first Sunday at the Red House was simply perfect. Not the shadow of a shade crossed her path until she had said goodbye to Molly in the evening. Even the weather was propitious, and when the morning mist had rolled off the common, another of those golden days, peculiar to autumn, seemed to flood Ebringham with warm mellow sunshine. The rich brown and amber tints of the bracken excited Waveney's admiration as they crossed a corner of the common on their way to church. It was the longest way, Doreen explained, but she had some business that took her to the upper end of the village. Then they walked slowly down the main street past the fountain and the Roman Catholic Church with its old lich gate. On the way, Waveney learned how the sisters spent their Sunday afternoons. Doreen always went to the home of rest for workers. One of the inmates had partially lost her sight, and Doreen generally read to her and wrote her letters. It was her custom to remain to tea. It gave the matron an hour's freedom and made a change for the ladies. The porch house was always thrown open for the girls' use from two to six on Sunday afternoons. There was no meal provided, but some of them liked to come up for an hour or two's reading or study or to meet their friends. In winter, there was always a bright fire and plenty of light, and Althea, stealing down the dark garden paths, would peep, unseen, at the merry group of chattering girls gathered round the fire. Athia's Bible class was always held in the dining room of the Red House. About twenty girls attended it. Waveney discovered later that Althea spent most of her mornings preparing for this class, but when she expressed a surprise at the amount of labor it involved, Althea only smiled. "'My dear, it is very necessary labor,' she returned. It is no easy matter, I assure you, to keep ahead of girls like Nora Greenwell and Alice Mitchell. I have to study for dear life, and sometimes the questions are so difficult to answer that I have to apply for help to our good vicar. I am very fond of my Sunday work, she said, as she and Waveney walked slowly on until Doreen should overtake them. Two or three of the girls always remain to tea. I give my invitations on Thursday evening, and as I make no distinction, and each one has her proper turn, there is no margin for jealousy. I limit the number to four, as I like my Sunday tea parties to be cosy. We call them library teas, and Mrs. Willis is generally very liberal with her cakes. Well, dear, why do you look at me so? I was only thinking how full your life is and how happy you must be, returned Waverley simply, and a faint flush rose to Althea's cheek. All lives ought to be full, she said gravely. It always makes me angry when people talk of empty, blighter, or disappointed lives. And her tone was so severe that Waveney felt vaguely surprised. But, Miss Hartford, she observed timidly, a great many women are disappointed, you know. Oh, yes, of course, life is as full of disappointments as this bush is full of blackberries this morning. But all the same, they have only themselves to blame if their existence is dull and colourless. There is too much mawkish sentiment talked at the present day, she went on. I was only telling my girl so the other day, when trouble comes to a woman, and heaven knows they have their share of suffering. I suppose, for their soul's good, it is no good creeping along the ground like a bird with a broken wing. They must summon all their pluck and fight their way through the thorns. Of course, even the brave ones get a little torn and scarred, but they are too proud to show their wounds. Look, here comes my sister and we will change the subject. And then, as Doreen joined them, they walked on quickly, but Althea's blue eyes had a strange glow in them. When Waveney reached Lone Square, she found Molly had kept her word, and was on the platform to receive her. She gave a little cry when she saw Waveney, and more than one passerby looked round with kindly amusement as the sisters rushed into each other's arms. Molly, how lovely you look! What have you done to yourself? But Molly only laughed. And then, like two children, they walked up the stairs hand in hand. And to Molly, it might have been the golden ladder that leads to paradise. Her dearer self, her twin sister, was beside her, and the five blank days were over. 
"'Father and Noel have gone for a walk,' she said, as they turned down King Street. "'I shall have you to myself for a whole hour. "'Oh, Wave, how are we to talk fast enough? "'So much has happened even in these five days. "'I wish I could write clever letters like you, but I am so stupid.' "'Nonsense, sweetheart. "'Why, I loved your letters, and always slept with them under my pillow. "'Did you really? "'Oh, Wave, what a darling you are. "'But of course I did the same.' and I was so amused that you're meeting the noticeable man with the large grey eyes. Father heard me chuckling, and he insisted on my reading your letter to him, but he was quite startled when I came to Mr. Chato's name. I don't think he was quite pleased. What makes you think that, Molly dear? Oh, he frowned and bit his lip. You know his way. And then he took up the newspaper and cleared his throat. But I heard him mutter, as though to himself, Another of them. Now I wonder which one of them it is. But as you only said Mr. Chater, I could not tell him. It was Thorold, returned Waveney. And then, as they came in sight of the house, she kissed her hand to it in a sort of ecstasy. Oh, you dear old place, I have dreamt of you every night. And then, as Molly used her latchkey, Mrs. Muggins came to meet them, purring loudly, with uplifted tail. Dear me, I never noticed how steep and narrow the staircase is, remarked Waveney innocently. And Molly, dear, you really must cause father to get some new stair drugget. Crimson felt would look so nice and warm, and would not cost much. But Molly shook her head. We must wait for that, I am afraid, she said sadly. Then she cheered up. But way, father has got such a lovely new greatcoat, and he does look so nice in it, and Noel insisted on his getting a new hat, too. I tell father that he will be ashamed to walk with me, now he has grown such a dandy. And then Molly broke off in confusion and began to blush, for Waveney's eyes were fixed on the round table in the studio. A magnificent basket of hot house grapes stood in the center. Waveney regarded it with the look of a cat that sees scream. There were three pounds at least, and the purple bloom of the fruit made a rich spot of color in the room. Waveney's expression was inscrutable. Molly, she said at last, the Black Prince has been here again. Yes, dear, stammered Molly with the air of a culprit discovered in a fault. But I did not expect him, I told you so. I was on my knees darning the stair carpets, because father caught his foot in a hole that very morning, and when Anne opened the door, there he was, and of course he saw me. Oh, of course, there is nothing wrong with Sir Reynard's eyes, muttered Waveney. They are very good eyes, I should say. But this remark seemed to puzzle Molly. Why do you call him Reynard, Waveney? He is not sly, not a bit of it. He was so funny. He wanted to help me with the stair carpet. He said he was good hand at darning, but I would not hear of such a thing, and of course I took him into the study. Well, child, what then? And Waveney seated herself on Grumps, and patted the sofa gently as an invitation for Molly to do the same. And then Sir Renard presented his grapes. Molly stamped her little foot. I will not have it, Waveney. You shall not call our nice little Monsieur Blackie by such a horrid name. Yes, he offered the grapes with such a droll little speech, but I can't remember exactly what he said, only that a friend of his has splendid vinery, and he always sent him such quantities of grapes, and it would be a charity to help him to eat them, and so on. Yes, and so on. And you said, Thank you, my dear Black Prince, you are very generous to poor little Cinderella. Waveney, if you talk such nonsense, I won't love you a bit. Of course I thanked him, and I must have done it nicely, for he looked pleased, almost as though he were relieved. That's right, he said hotly. What a sensible young lady you are, Miss Molly. You take things naturally and as you ought, and I wanted to please you. You know I always want to please you. Waveney caught her breath, and there was almost a look of fear in her eyes. Did he say those very words, Molly? Yes, dear, in a tranquil tone. And I am sure he meant it too. He did look so very kind. Do you know I wanted to please you the very first day I saw you? He went on. And it has been the same every day since. I am such a lonely sort of fellow since Gwen left me. Gwen is my sister, you know. And that fetched you, of course. But Waveney did not speak in her usual tone. And how she watched the bright speaking face beside her. Yes, indeed, I thought of you, and I asked such a lot of questions about this Gwendolyn, and I am sure he liked answering them. She is not pretty, Wave, not a bit. Ugly, in fact. But her husband adores her. She is very tall and graceful, but he told me he would not show me the picture he had in his pocket, because plain people were not in my line. Wasn't that a funny speech? And then we had a quarrel, but he stuck to his point. He said he hoped that some day he would be able to introduce her to us, 
and that he would rather wait till then. But wait, what am I thinking about? I meant you to have some grapes. And then she jumped up from her seat, and limped quickly to the table, and for a moment Webney's eyes were a little misty. How innocent she is, what a child! But I dare not enlighten her, she said to herself. I wonder what father thinks. If I can, I will just give him a hint. I think he ought to find out who Mr. Ingram really is. We know nothing about him. He may be in earnest. Very likely he is, but he ought not to come when Molly is alone. The hour passed all too quickly, and just as Waveney was giving a full description of Thursday evening, her father's voice made her start from her seat and fly downstairs. But there was no one that day to liken her to Titania. How Everard's face brightened at the sight of his darling, and even Noel chortled in his joy, to use his favourite expression. He actually submitted to be kissed twice without making a wry face, though he immediately turned up the collar of his coat. "'It has been rather tropical lately,' he observed blandly. "'But now all storm and stress has come. We must look out for draughts.' But Waveney was admiring the greatcoat, and took no notice. "'It is father's turn,' exclaimed Molly cheerfully. "'Noel, you must come and help me get tea ready. We shall have it in the studio, of course.' And then she stumped off to the kitchen, and Waveney and her father went upstairs. They had a little talk together. Everard asked a few questions about his old friends, and seemed much interested in all Waveney's descriptions. "'I think you have a good birth, dear,' he said presently, "'and that you are likely to be very happy with the Mrs. Hartford. "'Yes, father, I am sure that I shall soon learn to love Miss Athia. "'Good Queen Bess, as I call her. "'But, but,' the colour rise into her face as she squeezed her arm with her little hands, "'I would rather be at home with my dad.' I know that, darling, and Dad has missed this little girl badly. By the by, Waveney, there seems a plentiful crop of ghosts at the Red House. Molly tells me that the other night you met a Mr. Chater. Yes, father, Mr. Thorold Chater. He seemed very nice, and he read so beautifully. Miss Althea says he is a barrister, but that though he is so clever, he gets few briefs, and that he ekes out his income by doing literary work. He was always a clever fellow, returned Mr. Ward but I remember I liked Tristan better. Poor old Trist, he was a bit soft on Althea. I remember how angry he was when someone told him it was the lad's love. Thorold was a cut above us, and we were rather in awe of him. I wonder what sort of looking fellow he is now. He is tall and rather distinguished looking. I mean, people cannot help noticing him. Then Mr. Ward's eyes twinkled mischievously. A noticeable man, eh, Waveney? With large grey eyes? Then Waveney blushed and laughed. What a perfect is Molly! But, father, it is really such a true description. Mr. Chater is quite plain and ordinary looking, and he is old, too. Five and thirty, I should say. But when he speaks, you would never call him plain. No, I know what you mean. But his brother Tristan was a very handsome man. Did you know them well, father? Very well, indeed. The Chaters lived at the old manor house. The grandfather had bought it. It was a fine old place, about two miles from Kitlands, and when I visited them, they lived in good style and entertained largely. Old Chater, as we called him, was fond of life and gaiety. Though youngsters knew little about it, he kept racers, and about the time I married, his losses were so heavy that they could no longer afford to live in the old manor house. Were there only those two brothers, father dear? No, there was a sister Joanna, Joa they called her, a pretty fur girl. She and Althea were great friends. She was engaged to Leslie Parker. The Parkers were neighbours of theirs. They lived in a quaint old house in the village, called the Knolls, but I heard afterwards that when the old manor house was sold, and Mr. Chater died, the marriage was broken off. I never cared much for the Parkers. They were a mercenary lot. All the sons married women with money. But it was hard lines on poor little Joe. Oh, father, how dreadfully interesting all this is. I do so love ancient history. It was by no means interesting for the Chaters, returned Mr. Ward with a laugh. All Chaters' love for the turf ruined them. When he died, his sons found that his affairs were hopelessly involved, and that he had left heavy debts. I had lost sight of them by that time, but I heard a year or two afterwards that Mrs. Chater was dead too, and that Tristram had gone to New Zealand. Rumours said that he had turned out unsatisfactorily, and that his brother had shipped him off, but I know nothing more. Neither do I, except they are living in a dull-looking house in Dareham. And then Money limped in with the tea tray, and Noel followed, carrying a huge plum cake on his head, like one of the black slaves in the Arabian Nights. And then, 
As he made an obeisance like Lord Bateman's proud young porter, it rolled to his feet, after which Molly boxed his ears, and his father called him a young ass. They had a merry tea, and then they drew around the fire and sang hymns, and church time came only too quickly. Waveney had her old place between her father and Molly, and when the gas was turned down during the sermon, Molly slipped her hand into hers. And a dark young man, who was sitting a few pews behind them, watched them attentively through the service, and when in the dusk he saw Molly nestle up to her sister, a great softness came into his eyes, and he said to himself, Poor little thing! But as Noel strutted beside his sisters on the way to the station to see Waveney off, he said a thing that surprised them. "'Did you see my friend, the idealist?' he asked, with his chin elevated. "'My word, he looked quite the swagger gentleman in his new frock coat.' "'Do you mean Monsieur Blackie?' asked Waveney, and she pressed Molly's arm involuntarily. She had had no opportunity of giving her father that hint, and now she must wait for another week. "'Yes, Monsieur Blackie, Monsieur Blackie, Monsieur Blackie,' returned the provoking lad in a falsetto squeak. "'Hold hard, father, you have nearly landed me into the gutter.' And then, a little dark gentleman, who was following them unperceived, gave a low laugh. "'My friend the humorist that is tricks again,' he murmured. "'I wish Gwen could see that lad. She would love him.'" End of chapter 16